A very good afternoon to all of you. <clears throat> At the outset, let me thank KSOS and Malika Ma'am for this opportunity. Uh, my topic for today is pitfalls in perimetry and how we can avoid a few mistakes while doing them. So we can consider this under three headings. What should you think while advising a visual field test, while performing the test and while interpreting the test? When we advise a visual field test, we have to consider the patient demographics like are there any comorbid conditions? Uh, does the patient have any illness will he, which will inhibit him from doing the test? Like for example, a Parkinsonian patient with tremor or a patient with hearing loss or a patient with a cognitive dysfunction. So for such patients, we can do, instead of the full threshold strategy, we can do a CETA program. Uh, another thing is um, uh, about the language barriers. Uh, make sure that the patient will understand the language that you're speaking. Coming on to performing and interpreting, while performing, it is better that the testing technician or the optometrist has done a self-test on himself or herself to know the nuances of the test so that they can understand it better to the patient. Patient needs to be comfortably positioned. Always encourage, ask them to encourage the patient and reassure that the test can be passed in between and you can communicate to the patient that uh, we can always do, do this uh, test next time. So then uh, there's nothing to worry. Uh, the world will not stop. So you can always do the test at a later date. And also it is important to inform the patient that you need not press the button at every sea of light here and there. That is, the fixation has to be kept in mind and mindful that the lights will shine at varying intensity at four quadrants. You look at the center and whenever you see the light, you press the light. This is what I said about positioning. Uh, a comfortable positioning will go a long way in performing the test. So it is easier for the optometrist as well as for the uh, patient. Data entry, if not the date of birth, at least the year of birth has to be accurate as we all know because the essence of the test is to compare with the normative database. Make sure the best corrected visual acuity is entered properly, the pupil size, and you choose the correct strategy for the type of patient. Also, repeat the same strategy when you do the test next time. Use rimless lenses and not those lenses from your trial frame because that will create an edge artifact. If you have an added astigmatism, uh, use a spherical equivalent and not don't put two lenses in the same frame because that will again cause an error. High myops or high hypometrops, you can use contact lenses again to avoid the, uh, uh, you know, uh, defects which can be caused. Make sure that the fellow eye is closed properly, otherwise that eye will keep on wandering and it will cause a lot of fixation losses. Make sure that the fixation is not turned off during the test. Gaze tracking is very important. Uh, some patients will not be able to fixate properly, so it is our duty, I mean the technician's duty to see on the um, frame and that is on the monitor that the pupil uh, repeatedly they have to make sure that the pupil is in the correct position that is in the center of the green so that uh, the patient we have to make sure that the patient is seeing properly we also have the gaze tracking the gaze tracking um, uh, you know if there are so many if there are multiple deflections in the upward direction it shows that the patient is not fixating properly uh, and if there are deflections downward it shows that <clears throat> patient is frequently blinking so make use of both the techniques like the monitor as well as uh, the gaze tracking to know that the pupil is in the right track. Coming on to interpretation, a systematic interpretation is necessary. When you get a printout, just um, you have to see whether this is this a printout of my patient, that specific patient. That is the first thing. And then the reliability indices, the fixation losses, false positives and the false negatives. The next thing is, can we rely on the grayscale? How much importance do we give to the glaucoma hemifield test? And how should we assess the visual field index? Now let me lead, uh, I mean, read out this printout. So you can see this is the printout of a 45-year-old. And uh, the reliability indices look good. The program done is a central 24-2. The strategy chosen is CETA standard and always look at the visual acuity and the foveal threshold hand in hand. Raw values and grayscale, you can have a quick look and then look at the 
total deviation and the pattern deviation plot. Number six, total deviation plot and pattern deviation plot has both a numeric value which you see in the upper part and down you can see the probability plot. Then we come to the global indices number seven that uh, you have the four major global indices, the glaucoma hemifield test, the visual field index, mean deviation and the pattern standard deviation. So this is our printout. Now let's go into the detailed check of this printout. So this is a visual field showing um, a fixation loss. The machine itself tells us, you can see the arrow there where the machine itself has flagged as fixation loss. Uh, you can see two uh, you know, uh, cross signs there and the triangle there shows low test reliability. So the machine has made it easier for you. So the blind spot, so what could have happened is that the blind spot was not mapped correctly, the patient was not fixating on the central target or it could have even been a trigger happy patient or the other eye was not occluded properly so patient kept on moving the eyes or a head tilt. Now false positives are, are always happen with the trigger happy patients and in the gray scale you can see white scotomas. Machine says like uh, the learning is that 33% uh, is okay but it is always uh, better to be cautious and if the value is more than 20% uh, it needs to be re-evaluated. Uh, so false negatives can happen either due to a fatigue dye in consistent responses or in advanced glaucoma. Can I rely on the grayscale? Grayscale interpolates and create a picture of continuity and it is easier to explain to the patient. But uh, it is not statistically significant. But you can have a quick look at that and see whether there are any patterns. For example, the clover leaf pattern or if there is ptosis or if there is a white scotoma. So for that you can use. And how much importance do I give to GHT? Glaucoma hemifield test is based on five zones, uh, five points in the upper zone and the mirror images in the lower part of the field. So that is how it is compared. And the, remember that the points are same in the 24-2 as well as the 30-2 test. So that doesn't make a difference. The five possible messages, GHT messages are outside normal limits, borderline, generalized reduction sensitivity as in cataract, abnormally uh, or any other refractive errors, abnormally high sensitivity or within normal limits. Outside normal limits mean that the upper points, the five upper points and the five lower points in both the hemispheres, they are significantly different. So this becomes important because uh, they have been based on um, specific glaucoma points. So this is very important outside normal limits. So anything which doesn't fall into the ONL comes as borderline. Now VFI ranges from 0 to 100 and is expressed as a percentage of visual field, remember that VFI is always calculated from the pattern deviation plot. But if your mean deviation is more than 20%, that is calculated from the total deviation plot. So a few examples. So this, is, uh, this is a young myope disc suspect. You can see a visual field with, uh, on the left with a uh, central fixation defects. And on the right, there are no fixation defects. But for this 19-year-old, uh, it is mandatory that you do a 10-2 to, to pick up the early defects in the right eye. Uh, this is a post-trap one-eyed patient with a superior arcuate as well as an evolving inferior arcuate. Again, you have to do a 10-2. An advanced glaucoma. and advanced glaucoma, it is mandatory you do a macular threshold as well. Uh, a PSCG patient, the other eye of the PSCG, the better eye of the patient, you can see the yellow circle, you see a rim defect. But uh, remember that the rim defect it is a 24-2. So this cannot be considered as a rim defect. You have to repeat the test and make sure that if this uh, point persists, that rim defect-like thing persists in the 24-2, you have to consider it as glaucoma. And you have to do, I mean, clinically um, correlate and then start treatment if required. Now, always uh, understand the importance of repeating the visual field test and importance of creating a baseline. This is a test of the same patient who has been repeated like after 15 minutes and you can see the difference. From low test reliability, it has gone to normal. Uh, so, remember that in your glaucoma clinic, all patients does not have glaucoma. Some might have neurological field defects. Okay, so this is a homonymous hemianopia. And to avoid mistakes, a well-instructed patient, a skillful and a patient optometrist uh, patient, patience is very important and uh, clinician systematic approach can help in the diagnosis and assessing the progression, thus helping with the scientific management plan. Thank you so much. The mistakes will continue and we have to keep on correcting them. Thank you so much for your patient listening.
Thank you, Danya, for that lucid presentation. Now we go on to the 